his day. Through the years, Kellogg's reputation as an eccentric personality was only enhanced by his passion for new ways to harness nature for diet and health. He experimented with heat treatments and hydrotherapies. Scores of celebrities came to Battle Creek, including President William Howard Taft, King Edward, inventor Thomas Edison, pilot Amelia Earhart. Kellogg Sanitarium was now the largest health institution in the world. These rich people came because they wanted to feel better. It was very pragmatic. Uh, we know that these Adventists can do what we can't get elsewhere. And this was a tremendous boon to the Adventist health work. Adventist sanitariums began springing up across the country. But when the great Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground in the early part of the 20th century, Kellogg wanted to rebuild it on an even grander scale. A rift developed between the powerful Kellogg and church leaders. In the end, John Harvey Kellogg, who patented a process for making peanut butter, is credited with helping to inspire a national exercise movement, and who with his brother created a name synonymous with the breakfast food industry, broke from the church, but not before helping to put the Adventist approach to health and the creation of unique health facilities on the map. Florida Hospital admits 110,000 patients a year. We take care of uh, over a million patients in our outpatient settings and in our emergency rooms. And we operate on 150,000 people a, a year. We have become the largest admitter in the United States, the hospital that admits more patients than any other in the U.S., and also America's largest provider of Medicare services. Florida Hospital is not one hospital but a system of seven campuses across Greater Orlando. The newest project is a 400-bed wing that overlooks a lake to combine the healing power of nature with state-of-the-art medicine. It's called Ginsburg Tower, named for a key benefactor. Knowing it's a Seventh-day Adventist hospital and that my own particular faith is Jewish, I wanted to be sure that when you walked in the door, you were walking into a building whose professionals are here to cure you, not to convert you. There are more cardiac procedures done in this hospital than any place in America. And I also assume someday I'll be having my own heart attack, and I, and I want to be right here at, uh, in this building. It's wonderful to have this hospital wing here. Hope to gosh you never need it as a, as a patient. Very good. Hospital in America have faced one major problem. Nobody wants to go there. So how can you change the health of America if you're the last place people want to go and the first place they want to leave? It's just not a good way to go at things. And so we tried to create a place where we could heal the whole person throughout their whole life, both in sickness and in health. The idea of a hospital as a place in sickness and in health was built into the original design of one of Florida Hospital's most unique facilities, Celebration Health. Opened in the late 1990s, it's the health center for the community also known as Celebration. Originally designed by Disney as a model for the 21st century, Disney turned to the Adventists to partner with them in the creation and design for a new hospital. Embodied in the entire building, from the architecture, the feel of the place is all about wellness. When you drive up to hospitals ordinarily, you feel sicker than you already felt when you were actually coming in. We wanted people to begin their healing experience or their health experience from the time they actually drove in. And so when you look at the building, you feel really more like you're in a spa versus being in a hospital. Just off the entrance, what they like to call the front stage, the focus is on staying healthy. There is a pool and a fitness center used by hospital patients, doctors, staff, and the wider community. But it's on the backstage where celebration takes on the character of a traditional hospital. Here, the notion of community, central to most religions, is woven into the prescription for health care, as doctors often bring an entire team on morning rounds. 
We have a chaplain, we have our respiratory therapist, the dietary physical therapy, and it could vary between 10 to 15 to 20 people involved in the care. The team allows us to provide a more comprehensive care to the patient. You know, we can harness the skill of different people. And the notion of community also plays a role in how patients advance their own recovery. And this has all been scientifically shown that people do better when they're in a community. Um, we have become more isolated with our technology, but yet being able to interact with people, especially people who have gone through similar experiences as your own, give you feelings of hope. Our transportation service will help you get into the vehicle so you don't have to stress out about that. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> I love my husband, but he's not exactly the most gentlest person. <laughs> when you see somebody who's had more extensive work than you have, and they're working twice as hard and not getting anywhere near like where you're at, you'd be embarrassed to not do something about it. Yay! Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Doctors more and more starting to realize that there's a lot that they don't know about the human body. There's a lot that they don't know about healing. And I think that is where, you know, spirituality comes into play. You know, they know that if a patient feels connected to other people, that helps in their healing. But they don't understand, well, what is the actual mode of action? What's, what's that doing to the immune system? And that makes them a little nervous. You know, they want to always know exactly how everything works. Maybe it's okay just to know that what it does makes that person feel good, relieves their stress, and that's enough. Linda Lynch is a chaplain at Florida Hospital. In a system that believes in the connection between body, mind, and spirit, her domain is the spirit, primarily for women and infants. It means she works with many of the expectant mothers. I think one of my primary roles is to put them at ease, to come as a spokesperson for the hospital, and in my mind, more than a spokesperson for the hospital, a spokesperson for, for God. And so my presence, hopefully my manner, is just to lend to the beginning calm so that they can begin. Tonight, Yolanda Robinson is about to give birth to her third child. Push hard in your bottom. That's the push. Good, push, good, push. Keep pushing. Come on, good. Come on, good. Come on, good. Oh, he's coming, cuz. Perfect. Say, darling, keep going, keep going, keep going. There he is. All right. Oh, hey, man. Okay. You, Auntie, come on. Oh, my God. Get him. I'm trying to. There. Welcome to our world. This really is a precious moment for every mom. If the mom is strong, if the baby is strong, they're leaving shortly, in, in less than 48 hours. But some births are more complicated. Nikki Floyd broke her back in an accident while 40 weeks pregnant. The baby is taken by cesarean section and brought immediately to the neonatal intensive care unit. When any of us see suffering in a child, it calls forth from us questions about what it is to be human. It calls forth our helplessness, our vulnerability to see the tiniest, most fragile human beings still as works in progress. One pound, two pounds, three pounds. Very rarely do we have a baby in there that's regulation size that weighs six pounds or more. Oh, feisty Missy. 
everything good. Everything is beautiful. She's doing really good. Oh, praise the Lord. What a miracle. Yes. Right to see her father that way, to see how touched he was, how profoundly moved he was to see his daughter for the first time, because this face has never been revealed on the planet before. To be privy to the most intimate moments of individual lives, it's always an astounding place, a place of wonder, body, mind, and spirit. You gonna wake up for your close up? You gonna wake up? Wake up. Wake up. But sometimes those intimate moments can be very painful. A generation after baby Faye, Dr. Leonard Bailey oversees an intensive care unit where infants are waiting for heart transplants. While the procedure is never routine, the problem now is not expertise, but available donor hearts. So in the intensive care unit are both success stories and stories where the outcome is still uncertain, as one in four will die waiting for a donor heart. Seven years ago, Dr. Bailey transplanted the heart of Gael. Because of that operation, he is alive and well today. Someone changed my heart. Someone fixed up your heart? Do you know who is the doctor changed your heart? The doctor Bailey, yeah. Today, in an extraordinary turn of events, Dr. Bailey and his team will operate on Gael's five-month-old brother, David, who is now in desperate need of a new heart, a heart that has yet to be found. And this particular baby has kind of reached the end of his rope. Uh, David has uh, begun to die by degrees now, and unless we can extend his weightless time a little bit, I'm afraid we're gonna lose him. Too many people say that this happened to us before, it's more easy, but it's not really, it's not more easy. Every day he fights for his life. He's a fighter. How do you hand your baby over and then turn around and, and walk away? This is the day that they may be saying goodbye to their baby. Early in the operation, they did almost lose baby David. When you saw your kid, your baby, is fighting every day for his life, he tried to tell me, please don't stop. Please don't be sad because I am fighting. We never give up. We never give up. I'm probably in the best shape I've ever been in my entire life. I run probably between 30 and 40 miles a week. Um, I bike, I stay fit, I go to the gym, I watch what I eat. So Brett Troya was surprised when his doctor called to give him his test results. He goes, two came back positive. He goes, you have prostate cancer. And the first words out of my mouth were, you're kidding me. <laughs> because I didn't expect it at 41. Cancer does not discriminate. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care how old you are. So Brett began researching the latest in prostate treatment and volunteered to be part of a high-profile procedure. Obviously, robotic in the United States these days, it's the way to go. 75% of all patients who have prostate cancer surgery have it done robotically. Dr. Vipul Patel from Florida Hospital's Celebration is one of the world's leading robotic surgeons. Today, the procedure he will perform on Brett Troya will be viewed by 500 physicians at a conference center in Orlando and by doctors in Italy and Korea. I'm outside the operating room. My console is now outside. The team is inside, the patient's there. We have all our, all our doctors, all our nurses. I find it much more relaxing, uh, much more uh, efficient to actually be outside. The key is really having better vision and having more dexterity in confined spaces. That was the problem with open surgery. It was very difficult to see the prostate. It was a bloody field. 
and it's very difficult to save the nerves responsible for continence, sexual function, and cure the cancer. So that was the question. Are we going to be replaced by these robots? Uh, maybe. Uh, look what happened with the military. And today we have 9,000 robots on the battlefield. A robotic surgery unit is a several million dollar commitment up front. We think very hard when it comes to a, a new technology. It has to have the possibility of changing healthcare forever to make it safer, simpler, and less expensive. And you're beginning to see the pubovesical or puboprostatic ligament come into view right there, just to the right of the midline. Here at Celebration, we train over 6,000 physicians a year in minimally invasive technique. When you have the experts here who love to teach, and love to impart their knowledge, we lose nothing by sharing that. We've actually gained. And our job as surgeons is to continue to refine this technique. And I can tell you, 3,000 cases in, I'm still learning. And I think that's a brilliant, uh, brilliant display of it. I think we should all give him Thank a hand. Uh -huh. Really a nice, nicely done job. I think the next one is remote surgery. Like, I'm getting more and more remote, but I'm still connected directly. When it will really work is when I can connect like from here to maybe Africa or Korea and they, they need a, someone needs a surgery and they want me to do it and I would connect. If Dr. Patel can perform five surgeries a day, up to 20 a week, and he could possibly do it on a patient in California from Orlando, all right. uh, I'm all for go. it. All right. As long as they have a backup computer and one doesn't crash. <laughs> <laughs> Morning. Morning. As you can see, we can see go from skin and get some of the muscle right down to the vascular system and the bones. And we'll cut the head off and we'll lower him down like so. This area right here, we have an aneurysm so we can click that on, make that our center point. We go ahead and hit cube view, and there's your aneurysm right here. Everything that I just showed you there, we did probably in less than 30 seconds. Normally, I would take six, seven hours. 